Well, thank you, Dr. Gardner, for your introduction. I would probably be playing a little fast and loose with the truth if I were to say, well, I was training to play for the football team of Princeton in our annual in those days. I don't know if that's still the case, but it used to be the uh, two schools would engage in some friendly combat on the football field. Uh, that's not really the reason, but in any case, it is for me a great privilege and a delight to be with you, and it's particularly a delight for me to be here because of Dr. Gaffin. I've not been to the campus, but we've had contacts off and on through the years, and uh, seldom have I found myself disagreeing with Dr. Gaffin on anything. Now, I don't know whether what I'm going to say this morning will cause any difficulty. I even enjoy on occasion in the classroom saying to my students, somewhat on analogy to what an Old Testament professor at Calvin Seminary, uh, Professor Weingarten by name, uh, used to write in this style in some of his books, the Apostle Paul and I are agreed on this. <laughs> and I would say to the students, well, Dr. Murray and Dr. Gaffin and I are agreed on this, and it's almost as good as the canonical scriptures. But uh, actually, as I get to the matter at hand, which is my topic, uh, I thought to myself, well, Dr. Gaffin is known through the years as one who has properly emphasized Historia Salutis and placed the application of salvation by the working of the Spirit through the word Ordo Salutis within its appropriate, more comprehensive historical redemptive framework. Now, I'm going to assume all of that as I make my presentation this morning, but I'm focusing on, and maybe it's because I'm in the Dutch Reformed tradition, we have this tendency, uh, what might be called a particular question in the area of the ordo salutis. Not an unimportant question. That is, what is the relationship uh, between effectual calling uh, and regeneration? Should they be distinguished? And if so, how are they inseparable and related the one to the other? And more particularly, I'm interested in a critical reflection. Now, I trust at Westminster you're familiar with the uh, fact that a critical reflection does not mean a negative or I disapprove entirely. It means rendering a judgment about whether favorable or in some respects not entirely favorable about the use of speech act theory, uh, which is associated in our time with the writings of an evangelical, as he calls himself, Catholic theologian by the name of Kevin Van Hooser, whom I believe is actually an alumnus of uh, this institution. But I want, what I want to do is take a look at that question and to ask, should we, because the burden of Van Hooser's and Michael Horton, to an extent, has also made use of speech act theory and his formulation of effectual calling, um, my interest is to ask the question whether this is a helpful uh, usage and whether as they argue that we really don't need to sharply distinguish, if distinguish at all between effectual calling and regeneration, whether that should be approved of or embraced. But it's a sympathetic and critical evaluation that I'd like to engage in with you this morning. Um, I have three points, just to give you some hope that we're making progress as we go along today. Uh, three general uh, headings for my remarks on should effectual calling and regeneration be distinguished. The first is I want to review with you, uh, based not only on the Reformed Confessions classical like the Canons of Dort and the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, you should have received a little handout at the door with the program, which gives some portions of chapter 10 of the Westminster Confession, and as well a section from the third and fourth main head of doctrine of the Canons of Dort on our question regarding effectual calling and regeneration. So I'll begin with, as briefly as I'm able to do it, uh, a summary of what historically, in terms of the Ordo Salutis, uh, 
uh, Reformed theology has said about effectual calling and its relation to regeneration. My second main heading or area of reflection will be to give you, as best as I'm able, uh, again, it's only the tip of the iceberg in terms of the topic, which is highly complex and difficult, I give you as best as I can a, a broad statement of what Kevin Van Hooser proposes in terms of using speech act theory to formulate the doctrine of effectual calling and regeneration. And then the third and perhaps most important uh, section of my address will be to evaluate uh, biblically, confessionally, and theologically what is being proposed. Now I'll have to skim over the surface on some occasions. I hope to have some of this published in a future issue of the Mid-America Reform Journal, and so you can read the details and sort it out later if I should at some point or another lose you in my presentation this morning. But let's begin with a summary of the understanding of effectual calling and regeneration in the historic reform confessions. If I were to state it as concisely as possible, I would say that effectual calling is that mighty work of God, God the Holy Spirit, that with the word calls and summons lost sinners to communion and fellowship, union with Christ, and the enjoyment of all the blessings of salvation that are ours in him. And what makes that call, which is extended through the gospel as it is preached to lost sinners, what makes that call effectual is that the Spirit, and I choose my language here very carefully, not identified with the word through which sinners are summoned to faith, but accompanying that word with the powerful act of what sometimes is called the new birth or the work of the Holy Spirit in granting regeneration, making alive and thereby receptive and ensuring that those who would otherwise remain dead in their trespasses and sins come to Christ in response to the call effectually persuaded by the Spirit's working with the Word and by His regenerating power so that they do that which the Word calls them to do, namely, through conversion, are brought to faith and repentance and freely respond to the gospel call. Now, I'd like to delve into that, that's just by way of summary, a little bit more uh, deeply by looking with you, first of all, at two articles in the Canons of Dort. I don't know whether you have it available to you, but Canons of Dort 3, 4, Articles 11 and 12. And after uh, we've looked at that, I want to uh, give a quick summary of five propositions that are set forth in Turretin's Elenctic Theology on the question of effectual calling and regeneration. But first, the confessional statement, the Holy Spirit's work in conversion. Now, just something by way of context, the fourth, and that's where these articles fit, main point of doctrine in the Canons of Dort deal with the question, how does the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ poured out upon the church at Pentecost, work with the word, the gospel as it is preached and proclaimed in God's name, to draw sinners out of themselves, dead in trespasses and sins, into faith union with Christ. And as you may know, the third main point of doctrine says that the persons called are dead in their trespasses and sins, hostile toward God, their circumstance in their lost condition is one where they neither desire God nor seek after God nor are receptive, able to see and respond and hear what is communicated to them through the gospel. 
So how is it that the regenerating spirit, to use a phrase from a preceding article, draws sinners through the gospel call and enables them and ensures that they respond to the gospel call as they should? Well, Article 11 puts it this way. Moreover, when God carries out this good pleasure, that is, his purpose to save his people in his chosen ones, or works true conversion in them, he not only sees to it that the gospel is proclaimed to them outwardly and enlightens their minds powerfully by the Holy Spirit so that they may rightly understand and discern the things of the Spirit of God, but by the effective operation of the same regenerating spirit, he also penetrates into the inmost being of man, opens the closed heart, softens the hard heart, circumcises the heart that is uncircumcised. And here's a particularly important phrase. He, that is the spirit, infuses new qualities into the will, making the dead will alive, the evil one good, the unwilling one willing, and the stubborn one compliant. He activates and strengthens the will so that, like a good tree, it may be enabled to produce the fruits of good deeds. Now, I recognize that that's a rather fulsome and even complex statement but what the authors of the canons are wanting to argue there is that when someone is addressed with the gospel, the word of God concerning his saving, uh, the saving work of his son Jesus Christ is proclaimed and those who hear the gospel word are summoned to faith and repentance to conversion. I'll insert a John Murrayism. The link, the one who enables that gospel call to receive a ready hearing, to elicit the response that the call of the gospel demands, namely, receive Christ, come to him, to be drawn into fellowship with him in the way of faith requires an action of the Holy Spirit together with the Word, not apart from the Word. The Word and Spirit are bound up and closely interrelated. But there is an action of the Spirit that goes beyond the power of the Word that is spoken, the outward call of the Gospel, if I may put it in those terms, as the confessions often put it so as to grant new life at the core of the being of the sinner whom the gospel call summons, to give them understanding. In John 3, as you may recall, that great passage on the new birth, our Lord says, unless one is born of the Spirit, one is not able to see the kingdom, which theologically is oftentimes associated with what we call the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Unless the Spirit give us sight, we will not see the glory of God as it shines in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, because the God of this age will have blinded our minds and eyes to the gospel and to the work of Christ in all of its glory, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. So the Spirit has to act. And the John Murrayism that I promised you a moment ago in his redemption accomplished and applied when he treats the question of regeneration, he uses the word link or the point of intersection, that on account of which the gospel call produces, effectually persuades and brings its recipient to do what is obliged is this mighty work of the Holy Spirit in regeneration that surpasses, though it is not worked apart from the word, but surpasses any power that resides within the word alone, absent the Spirit's working with the word. And that language, we'll see it in turn, and also 
He infuses, that is, the Spirit infuses new qualities into the will. We're going to see as a piece of expression or phraseology to which Van Hooser takes some exception. Uh, just to clarify things, that is not suggesting that God makes, by the Spirit's work in regeneration, a whole new person. You could say the language of infuses new habits means replaces a heart of stone with a heart become by the Spirit's enlivening work receptive. Or you could use the language of the Spirit's work in regeneration is restorative. It's renewing. It's an enlivening and otherwise dead and stony heart, an otherwise will that is subject in bondage to sin and unwilling to do that which God calls us to do through the gospel call. All of those features of who we are as image bearers of God, of heart, of will, of intellect, uh, of disposition, that are opposed to the word that comes to us through the gospel, the spirit working in regeneration and enlivening, touching us at the core of who we are as God's image bearers, enables us to respond to the gospel call. And therefore, what I'm suggesting to you is that this language doesn't pull apart or separate what the Spirit does through the Word in calling lost sinners to faith and repentance, but it does articulate a careful distinction between a work of the Spirit not apart from the Word, you could say a work of the Spirit with the Word in regeneration, that enables, and not only enables, but ensures, without which it wouldn't occur, that those who are called by the gospel respond as they should in the way of faith and repentance. Conversion, conversion is God's action effected by the Spirit through the instrumentality of the Word. But absent the Spirit's working in regeneration, it would not produce its desired effect. Now, I told you I was going to also utilize uh, a classic representation of this point of distinction between effectual calling and regeneration without separation. Didn't mention at that, that at the beginning of my presentation, there are two axioms that are particularly important in theological reflection. And particularly as it relates to issues in ordo salutis, one is distinctio sed non separatio. You may need to distinguish, but you must not separate. A companion to that one is uh, the language could possibly be used that we should not only not distinguish in such a way as to separate, but in distinguishing well we also clarify or we teach well. And if I may say to you, that's certainly true of Turretin. Turretin, if he were here, would say yes and amen to the notion that distinction, distinctions are good and appropriate and necessary provided they don't lead to inappropriate separations. And no more so is that true than as it relates to our topic, effectual calling and regeneration. Now, the reason I turn to Turretin is not that he's better than Bavink, but he provides what he himself would have called a consensus presentation of Reformed theology in the uh, late 17th century. It's not Turretin's interest to depart from the consensus of Reform theology on the question in distinction from Roman Catholicism or Lutheranism or Arminianism, who are often his combatants or those with whom he's engaged as he treats various topics. Now, it's in topics 
11 through 17 of his elenctic, which means apologetical, providing a defense over against views that he treats as erroneous, consensus expression of Reformed theology. It's in the 11th through 17th topics that he deals with the subject of effectual calling and regeneration. And happily for our purpose, it can be summarized in his five propositions. He offers five propositions on what he calls the efficacy of the gospel call. What makes the gospel call when sinners are summoned into fellowship with Christ by means of the ministry of the word? What makes it efficacious? How is it that the spirit with the word is able to draw others, those who are lost in sin, into fellowship with God? Now, his first proposition is very interesting. Uh, if you know anything about Turretin, you probably think, well, he's a very scholastic theologian. His distinctions are not only in some instances useful, but in others even hair-splitting. We like to use that sort of language when it comes to scholastics when we want to be critical of them. But here's what's striking about his propositions. Guess where he starts on effectual calling and regeneration. He starts, his first proposition is, the ways of the Lord in grace as well as in nature are inscrutable. He acknowledges at the very beginning that he's not able to fully sort out and see his way through the way in which the Spirit working with the Word draws men and women out of their lost estate into fellowship union with Christ by the preaching of the Holy Gospel. That's the first proposition. In the confessions, the language is often used that the working of the Spirit with the Word in effectual calling and regeneration is ineffable. And our Lord tells us that. The Spirit's work is always mysterious, powerful, unable to be fully explained or in some sense comprehended. Like the wind that blows, you don't know from whence it comes, where it is going, but you see its effects. That's the first prop. The second proposition is the movement of efficacious grace, says Turretin, in man is not after the manner of an only simultaneous concourse, but also after the manner of a principle and of a previous concourse or predetermination. And you may say to me, well, what exactly is he getting at? What he's saying is we mustn't think of the working of the Spirit with the Word in the gospel call as to its efficacy as though the Spirit were doing his part and we were doing ours. Simultaneously, coordinately, partly the Spirit's working, partly our working. He even uses for Turretin a rather homely example. He says it's not like two horses pulling a chariot, each of them independently determining whether they're going to go in the same direction in their pulling. The principal actor and author, the one who renders the gospel call efficacious, is the Holy Spirit working with the Word in regeneration. Though that's not a work that diminishes or in any way denies the full engagement or in any way diminishes the sense in which those who are brought to conversion themselves believe and themselves repent and that they do so actively and willingly by virtue of that life-giving work of the Spirit attending the Word that enables them to do so. His third proposition picks up the language of Canons of Dort, Article 3, in the third and fourth head of doctrine, that language of infused habits. It goes like this, as conversion can be considered under a twofold relation, either as habitual or as actual, so both God and man certainly concur in 
conversion, but in such a way that in both the glory of the whole action ought to be ascribed to God alone. His language of habitual in distinction from actual, actual means to suggest that unless the Spirit grant through re regeneration new, we, we would use the language habits of heart, habits of mind, habits of disposition and the like, unless the tree, as the confessions often put it, citing the gospel word of our Lord, unless a tree is made good, it will not produce good fr fruits. And that's the work of the Spirit narrowly conceived in habitual conversion or regeneration that is a necessary precondition for the actual coming to faith and conversion of any lost sinner. Uh, his, la his fourth proposition is this, the movement of effectual, efficacious grace is properly to be called neither physical nor ethical, but supernatural and divine. You may say, well, what does Turretin have in mind there? Uh, this is something that's often misunderstood in the language of Turretin and in, in the older Reformed tradition. When the language of not simply in a physical mode is employed, we think, of physical in the sense of physical entities being affected one by another, like moving a billiard ball by hitting it with another on a table. Turretin is using the word physical in the precise sense, unless the nature fallen and corrupted of the lost sinner who is dead, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, in trespasses and sins, has been enlivened, changed, regenerated, restored, healed. It will not be able to act as it all ought, or another way of putting it, and he puts it this way actually in his explanation of this fourth proposition, unless a thing exists, that is, unless the will has been made alive, the heart has been made receptive, the intellect has been illumined, there will not be engendered the response that the gospel call requires. And so what he calls habitual grace, the changing, regenerating work of the Holy Spirit must come before the act whereby we respond as we should by virtue of the Spirit's working to the gospel call. His fifth and last proposition is that in respect to that work of the Spirit narrowly conceived, namely regeneration, the new birth, the Spirit acts directly and immediately and not immediately through the Word alone. The Word does not have the power to bring anyone to do what the Word itself requires. Only the Spirit, with accompanying the Word, is able to bring us to that point, or to use language that's often used regarding our Lord's discourse on the new birth, regeneration, and John 3. With respect to our new birth, we are not, not actors, but those who are acted upon. He used the language even expressly used in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 10. In that act, the Spirit acts alone, and we are passive. No one gives himself birth. The action of the Spirit in regeneration is antecedent to anything that we do. It's an act of the Spirit in respect to which we are purely recipients. It's a, the theologians would put it this way, a monergistic act. The Spirit alone authors it. It's an act in respect to which we are receptive and what we become in consequence of it is able to act in a way that answers to what the gospel requires. So let me summarize what I've told you thus far regarding the traditional understanding of effectual calling and regeneration. Effectual calling is a work of persuasion that takes place always or 
I should say, ordinarily through the ministry of the word. Secondly, effectual calling is an act that the spirit, in respect to its efficacy, performs in a way that goes beyond any power resident in the word simpliciter, left to itself. The word, absent the Spirit's working with it in regeneration, is not able to grant that response in the way of faith and repentance that the gospel call demands. And thus, a distinction is typically made at this point between the call of the gospel in its general and indiscriminate presentation to all lost sinners and what is sometimes called internal calling or that work of the Spirit accompanying the gospel, which according to God's purpose enables that call to receive the response demanded as the Spirit enables through the work of regeneration. Uh, We must therefore distinguish the outward preaching of the gospel and the Spirit's inward work in regeneration that ensures our response to the gospel. I probably belabored all of this a little more than I ought because I have to get now quickly to the divine, or I should say the speech act proposal of Van Hooser. And basically what Von Hooser argues, and we don't have time this uh, morning at all to go into the setting within which Von Hooser advances his proposal. It's, much, it's part of a much larger project which wants to uh, very much emphasize that God in his relation to the world, and in particular in his dealings with human beings who bear his image, always acts through the word that he speaks. God is a communicative agent. And uh, Van Hooser is attempting in a postmodern context, particularly in a context where linguistic philosophy is the sort of lingua franca of modern philosophical and theological reflection. He's trying to employ and uh, utilize some of the findings of Uh, what is sometimes called speech act theory or the philosophy of speech acts to reformulate the doctrine of effectual calling and regeneration. And the reason he does this is he thinks that the view that I have thus far represented, which says that in addition to the word being proclaimed with its call to faith and repentance, the spirit works alone, as the Spirit alone is able to work, in the narrow sense of regeneration, in granting that restoration and renewal and enlivening of our hearts, wills, minds, and dispositions, what the canons in awkward language call the infusion of new habits, so as to enable and ensure that we respond to the gospel call the way we should, Van Van Hooser's worry is that this represents God's efficacy in calling people through the gospel into fellowship with himself in terms that are less than fully personal that are less than fully tethered and comprehended and circumscribed by the word that God speaks. And he's basically wanting to argue that the gospel word, because it is God who speaks by his spirit through the word, is itself regenerative. It creates its effect. Now, I have to do a little bit of background here on the question of what are are the components of speech act theory? Well, speech act theory, we can't go into the history of this, but speech act theory basically wants to focus upon the way when we speak and when we communicate through words, we aim to bring about a certain result. 
We speak in order to inform people so that they become more knowledgeable. We speak in ways that are intended to warn them about consequences of certain types of actions. We speak in ways that summon people to do something or another or not do something or another. Uh, we speak in a way that aims to bring about some kind of effect. Now, speech act theory in this connection wants to illustrate that by making a distinction between what we say, what is said, the words that are spoken, or as it's termed, the locution. What did so-and-so say? From when we speak, if speaking aims to bring about a result, the illocution of what is uttered. Not simply the words spoken, but what do you intend to effect by speaking those words? And then thirdly, there is what's called not the locution, what is said, or the illocution, why did you say it, but the perlocution, what do you hope to accomplish? And was it accomplished? The perlocutionary effect is the result or the doing accomplishment of what the word that was uttered with its aim hoped to accomplish. Now, maybe a couple of illustrations of that that are fairly simple, um, perhaps too simple. One of them would be if I were to, in a theater, cry out at a certain point, fire! unless I was up to some mischief and trying to create a bit of confusion and fear in the ranks unnecessarily, it was my aim, because there was a fire, to warn everyone, to call it to their attention in order that they might exit the building in time so as not to be injured or be extinguished through the fire that's begun to rage. So the locution is the exclamation fire, calling people to a certain action. The illocution is the aim of the locution, that is, what did I want to accomplish? Flee the building. The perlocution is, they heard the word and they did accordingly, they fled. That's its perlocutionary effect. Another common example that is often used is, if I'm conducting as a minister and an officer of the state as well, a wedding ceremony, and I had a particularly important moment in the ceremony, say, now I declare you husband and wife. That's not just uh, speaking something that is true, an utterance. It has a particular purpose and aim. It's as an officer of the state and a representative of Christ to uh, confirm and pronounce to be so the union between this man and this woman. Now, you might ask, what's that got to do with the gospel call? Well, very simply put, Von Hooser wants to argue that rather than viewing the gospel call as in its efficacy, efficacious because the Spirit accompanies the word, by granting the new birth so as to enable the response to the word, we can, in a manner of speaking, ascribe efficacy to the word itself because of its authorship. When God speaks, people not only listen, but his, work has, his word has perlocutionary effect. It brings about its intended purpose. It, it's, it has perlocutionary effect because of its divine authorship. And the interest that Van Hooser has at this point is to resist what he thinks in the older paradigm and understanding is a manipulative view of how the spirit operates with the word so as to ensure the result, namely that we come in faith and repentance. 
Now, Van Hooser doesn't want to adopt a sort of an Arminian view of the gospel call where all God does is declare, save those who do something independently and apart from his having drawn them into fellowship with Christ. They put themselves into Christ by their free and independent decision to believe in him. He wants to say the call of the gospel is a little bit like Christ's words to Lazarus in the tomb. Lazarus, come out. And it's a creative, powerful, efficacious word that produces its intended effect. Um, so he's not wanting to in any way diminish the power and efficacy of the word, the energy that resides within God's speaking, but he doesn't want to distinguish an act of the Spirit in regeneration in the narrow sense that enables our response to the gospel from the word that is spoken, the word itself as a total speech act because it's God's speech is not only an utterance with a particular aim, illocution, but it has its perlocutionary effect. The Spirit of God in a manner of speaking, comes to the word, advenes upon the word, is a phrase that he employs, so as to make it efficacious. And therefore, we don't need, as in the older formulation, to speak of any action on the part of the Holy Spirit in respect to which we are passive, the Spirit alone authors the new birth, where we are brought to do even as God intends by his accompanying the, the call of the gospel with the life-giving power of his Holy Spirit. Uh, we're able to uh, treat the gospel recipient, the one to whom the word is spoken, as one who is in, he, in, he employs the language often of engaged in dialogue in a conversation where God is the principal speaker and we respond. But we do so at the level of our personhood. We're not being moved about. The options that he typically acknowledges are we either, as in the older understanding, at some point represent God's work by the Spirit with the Word in a manipulative, coercive fashion, like a physical moving and causing an effect. He doesn't like the language of efficient causality. He prefers to use the language of uh, a perlocutionary effect that is brought about by the word that God himself speaks. So it treats us as true conversation partners who are in, you might say, dialogue with God. And when God speaks, his word proves persuasive and brings about its appropriate effect. But no sharp distinction of any sort needs any longer to be made between the word as itself intrinsically regenerative and a working of the spirit with the word. Now, I'd like to spend the remainder, I've almost exhausted my time, but the remainder of my time offering a few comments by way of critique of Van Hooser's proposal. Uh, the first comment is very simply, uh, I appreciate his desire to not disconnect whatever the Spirit does in the gospel's communication through the call of the gospel from the word that is spoken. Any Reformed theologian, and broadly speaking, Von Hooser is a Reformed theologian, does not want to separate the working and ministry of Christ's Spirit from the gospel word that summons us to fellowship with Christ in the way of faith and repentance. In that respect, the concern and burden of a great deal of what Von Hooser is arguing is not absent from the traditional view. And there are many similarities. Paul does say in Romans, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. 
Men and women are not ordinarily brought into Christ in any other way through, than through the ministry of the word. So that's a comment, broadly speaking, of appreciation for von Hooser's use of speech act theory uh, to explain the efficacy of the gospel call. But I have several concerns or points that I'd like to raise, both biblical, confessional, and theological, that I think the Speech Act proposal doesn't adequately address or resolve. The first is this. I'll use a biblical expression of our Lord in the New Testament Gospels, where he concludes one of his parables, many are called, but few are chosen. Any gospel preacher knows that when you go with the, in the name of Christ and in the power of his spirit with the word and call men and women to faith and repentance, you get a diversity of response. Some believe, some do not. Some come and are drawn into communion with Christ. Others remain indifferent or resistant to the gospel call. What makes the one to differ from the other? I didn't use this language earlier in summarizing Turretin's view, but he says the efficacy of grace always depends upon God's a priori purpose in the call that is extended through the gospel when it is a calling according to purpose. And he's using the language of Paul in Romans, particularly chapter 8, those who are called according to God's purpose or in that familiar passage in Romans 8 as well, the so-called golden chain, those whom he predestined, he also called. Van Hooser's proposal to the use of speech act theory and the ascribing to the word that is spoken an efficacy such that it produces, in terms of its perlocutionary effect, what God intends, would suggest that wherever the word of God is truly spoken in terms of the gospel call, that it ought to produce, and one would expect it produces, its intended effect. And what per Turretin says, not criticizing obviously Van Hooser, but in anticipation of what Van Hooser is arguing, that the efficacy of the call of the gospel has to ultimately be ascribed to the purpose according to God's election wherewith that gospel call comes. It doesn't derive a posteriori, that is, from what actually takes place upon the gospel words having been spoken. You can't derive the efficacy of the gospel call from the mere presentation of the gospel word. You have to take into consideration the truth that though many are called, not all, few, are chosen. There's a second problem that I would associate with the a proposal to use speech act theory. One of the interests and burdens, as I said to you earlier, of the older view of regeneration in the narrow sense is that in our lost circumstances as sinners, if you look at what the scriptures teach us about men and women fallen in Adam in their sin, in the Heidelberg Catechism with which I'm familiar, there's an interesting answer to the question, um, about our fallen condition where the answer says, uh, I am by nature inclined to hate God and my neighbor. It's a pretty strong statement. But notice the language, by nature, according to my phusis, who I am in my lost condition, in my sinful estate. And we don't have time to adduce all of the ways in which the scriptures describe that fallen condition. I don't like the language of total depravity. I prefer the terminology of radical depravity because it quite properly locates the problem where it exists. That is at the core, the root of who we are as people within our very heart, the innermost recesses of our being out of which are the issues of life our willing, our thinking, our 
our affections, all that we are as sinners is bound up under and is in a circumstance such that unless the Spirit work upon us, healing, restoring, enlivening, and renewing, it's as simple as Paul's language in Ephesians 2.1 puts it. If you're dead in trespasses and sins, unless made alive, you will not be enabled or capable of doing what the word of the gospel requires of you. And the doctrine of regeneration in its narrow sense as the link between gospel call and our response, to use Murray's language, underscores for us that unless the Spirit attend the word of God with a powerful work of granting spiritual life, enlivening our very nature, we will never respond to the gospel call as the gospel call demands. It's not accidental when he defines the gospel call that is Turretin. He defines as a, as, as a call to lost sinners who are dead in their sins, who are called through the gospel into union with Christ. And I don't find in uh, Van Hooser's formulation of the efficacy through the use of speech act theory for explaining the efficacy of the gospel call any elucidation and answer to the question, how is it that God by the spirit works so as to enable some but not all to do what is required of them? The older language, which I think he sometimes misunderstands, of regeneration as a renewing of our fallen nature, it's not a physical action in our sense of the term physical, but it's an enlivening action so as to give us the wherewithal to do what people who are alive do, that is, act in a certain way. Now, there is also a third observation in the scriptures. In the older view, there are passages that, in a variety of ways, I think underscore the necessity of a distinction between effectual calling and the use of the word together with an act of the Spirit in regeneration. And uh, in the interest of time, read John Murray on the question of regeneration. If we had time, I'd do a little exposition of John 3 and some of the passages in 1 John uh, on the topic of regeneration, and you'll find that every action that we perform willingly through the life-giving working of the Spirit through the Word in the way of faith and repentance is in consequence of an antecedent action whereby the Spirit gave us new birth. Now, I know Dr. Gaffin points out often in his writings that uh, Paul doesn't use the language of regeneration in this narrow sense. He uses language of new creation, of the renewal of all things, the making new, the enlivening, life-giving working of the Holy Spirit. But in effect, it's an inexpressible and unsurpassably immeasurably great power of which Paul is speaking. And in John's the Gospel of John and then the Johannine 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the theme of regeneration in this more narrow sense does come to the foreground. And any theological and confessional summary of how the Spirit works with the Word in effectual calling has to take those passages into account. And I don't find in uh, Van Hooser's proposal any engagement with these passages. Uh, why, I'm not sure, but they certainly don't uh, entirely correlate with the thesis he's wanting to make, that the word alone, because it's a species of divine rhetoric, it's a word God speaks, can accomplish its purpose by its merely being spoken. Now, what about the necessity of the life-giving renewal that is regeneration to enable that response? It's also interesting that, I didn't mention this earlier, one of the proof texts often cited is in Acts 16, 14, where Paul is ministering the gospel to Lydia and her household. And we read there that, I'll just 
make sure I read it correctly, the Lord opened, we're told, her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And I get this language from Paul Helm. Uh, Von Hooser basically argues that through the word, the Lord opened her heart. Through the word that has a kind of intrinsic efficacy to do so, she was brought to respond as she did and pay attention to what Paul said. But that's to, make, to take the text and read it back to front. Her paying attention to what was said by Paul, according to Acts 16, 14, was in consequence. There's an infinitive of two. What occurs, occurs in consequence of an act of the Lord in opening her heart. Now, that's the sort of passage that supports a distinction that says that unless God does something by the Spirit with the Word as the Word is ministered, the response that is demanded will not take place. Now, it's interesting that in Paul's epistles, there are also indications at various points that the Word alone absent God's powerful use of that word and enablement such that it be received for what it is, is not able to bring anyone to faith and repentance. Think of what he says in 1 Corinthians 2, a word that to many is foolishness and weakness is to those who believe, who are, believe, who are called. He'll even use the language at a certain point who, whom, as they receive the gospel in faith, there is, as he puts it in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, a demonstration of the spirit and of power. Maybe this is not a good way of putting it, but anyone who preaches the gospel word from Lord's Day to Lord's Day or in whatever setting knows that unless the spirit attend the word spoken, your most articulate sermon, your best piece of exposition of the Word of God, your impressive rhetoric, and all the rest, you fill in the blanks, won't get it done unless in demonstration of the power of the Spirit, the Word be accompanied in a way. It's a little bit like Paul's language as well in Corinthians when he says, one waters, another one one plants, one waters, but who gives the increase? All the sowing of the seed without the Spirit's accompaniment of that sowing and granting according to God's purpose the increase, it will have no proper effect. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.5, Paul puts it this way, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Now, I have some other passages. I, I've left myself inadequate time. I think I'm being told that, too, in the back. But I wanted to spend a little time on a couple of key passages, James 1.18 and 2 Peter 1.23, which are the passages most commonly adduced for arguing that the Spirit using the Word produces new birth through that very Word. But I've, I've exhausted my time, and I shall have to draw things, therefore, very quickly to a conclusion. Uh, my conclusion with more arguments than I've been able to uh, communicate to you this morning, is that though the word is an indispensable, ordinary means whereby, in the course of time, those whom God purposes to save are brought through its ministry into union with Christ. Unless a distinct act of the Holy Spirit in granting new life through the work of regeneration, new birth, accompany that word. That word will not produce the effect intended or desired. So that the speech act proposal in a somewhat 
loose way of putting it, tends to reduce the complexity of the relationship between spirit and word in, in gospel preaching and in the gospel call and swallows up, in a manner of speaking, the distinctive action of the Holy Spirit that must ever accompany the word in order to give it its desired effect. Well, with some apology for having come with more than I had time to present, I thank you for your patience. And again, I express my gratitude for the opportunity to be with you uh, this day.